Hello and thank you for joining us on Resource PNG. The extractive industry may have a lot to do with minerals, oil and gas, but the essence of this industry is the people. And to work in this very demanding field, you can work out quite an appetite. That is where the Alliance Group comes in. This group has been satisfying the palates of the hungry workers for a number of years. So where is this company at right now? Here is a presentation from the Alliance Group National Content and Community Affairs Manager, Michael Verapik, when he did this at the second annual gas conference recently. Okay, at last count, we have about 57 nationalities in the LNG workforce in Papua New Guinea. We have employees from all over the world with different taste buds, with different food stuff. So finding a common menu is a humongous headache for us. Now, a little bit about us, the Alliance Group. We are a 100% owned company by NCS. NCS are also in the same ministry as us, and uh, they are owned by the Anitua Group of Companies. Now, the Anitua Group of Companies uh, is probably one of the best success landowner stories in Papua New Guinea. It's a, it's a very diversified group of companies that is based on Lihir, and it's owned by the people of Lihir, on whose land are uh, Newcrest Mines um, at the giant uh, Lihir uh, Gold Project. Um, later on, I'll show you a slide of the, the, uh, the, uh, the group of companies. Um, originally, the Alliance Group was a joint venture company between NCS and um, Gulf Catering Services of Kuwait uh, when we were bidding for the project. So we needed uh, an international partner and uh, we uh, ended up with uh, GCC Services and uh, the joint venture company was the Alliance Group. ExxonMobil uh, in the process also um, set up, uh, as we have heard, two umbrella companies. The upstream part of the, uh, the, um, the development, uh, they set up Heights Gas Development Company, and a number of the locals, uh, Papua New Guinea locals who were here are part of that company. And the downstream processing part of that project, uh, they set up Laba Holdings uh, Limited. Now, uh, there are a number of services that are mandated uh, to be performed by these uh, umbrella companies, and one of them is catering. So in the process, the Alliance Group um, formed joint ventures with both umbrella companies. And as a result, um, LEG, Laba, Laba Alliance Group, is a joint venture between TAG and Laba Holdings Limited. And we provide camp management, catering, and support services to the big uh, plant site uh, outside of Port Mosby. And HEG, Heights Alliance Group, is the joint venture company uh, between uh, TAG and HCDC, and we provide uh, the same services up in Heights. Uh, we manage about eight sites, eight camps in Heights. Now recently, um, in about April, April this year, NCS bought out its international partner, GCC Services. So now the Alliance Group is a 100% Papua New Guinea company and 100% owned by NCS. That's probably not, uh, not very clear. I don't think you can read that, but that gives you the structure of the Anitua Group, which owns um, NCS and uh, also uh, the Alliance Group. Now, at the top there, which is, um, my apologies, it's not very clear, it's uh, the, land of the, the, uh, the shareholders of the Anitua Group. And the shareholders are the six major clans representing the people of Lihir and uh, 2,500 individuals which own the group, the Anitua group. Uh, yesterday we spoke about uh, ILGs, incorporated land groups. On Lihir it's different. They, they manage it differently and very, very successfully at that. We have six major clans representing the whole island of Lihir owners of the Sanitua group, and it's a very diversified group. Total turnover of the group is in excess of about 500 million kina. So it's a big group. And it is probably the biggest 
landowner success stories in the country. They are well poised to, do, to undertake any mining services, which includes mining and maybe the LNG project. And between NCS and us, the Alliance Group, we've basically carved up the country very nicely. NCS provides catering uh, to all the Defence Force camps in Papua New Guinea and to um, the mines like on Lee here, Newcrest Mining on Lee here, up in um, Waubolo to a Morabed Joint Venture. They have just clinched the catering deal with uh, Wafi Golpu, and that's a major, major project. And if that is fully developed, it's probably amongst probably the world's biggest gold mines in the world, in Papua New Guinea. And that it will have um, a permanent on-site residence of about 9,000 people for, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 years. So, and they've got to be fed three square meals a day. So that's a huge, a huge project, that one. Okay, our role uh, in the LNG project, apart from others, is uh, the provision of camp management, which involves the management of rooms, allocation of rooms and keys, housekeeping, laundry services, the provision of catering services, which involves procurement of food supplies locally and internationally, menu planning for 57 nationalities, which one humongous headache. Uh, we have Bangladeshis and Indians. At the moment, in the plant site in Port Mosby, we have seven menus on any one day. And I mean, the Bangladeshis and the Indians have their own, the Filipinos have their own, the Koreans have their own, the Japs have their own and now the Europeans have their own. So planning, planning that menu and sourcing the ingredients for that menu is, is a major challenge for us. And of course, we have um, Muslims working for us. So in the preparation of food, you gotta be careful that you, meet, you don't mix their food. If you want the right, you mix their food with pork and you'll have a right on your hand. So the art of preparing food is also a challenge for us to ensure that you don't upset, say, the, the Muslims, with their religions and their customs. We also provide support services in maintenance, garbage collection and management of incinerators, water and uh, sewage management, and landscaping. So, I mean, yesterday we had uh, a myriad of presenters uh, presenting the technical aspects of projects in Papua New Guinea. But after they've been out in the field, down mine shafts underneath heavy equipments, all they want to do is come back home, have a hot shower, a hot meal, and go to bed. That's what we are there for. Okay, management and compliance with the contracts. Now, in, in, in any contract, I suppose, including ours, in our business, contracts can be cost plus, and contracts can be lump sum fixed contracts based on mandate rates. I suppose cost plus contracts, the more you spend the developer's dollar, the more you get back. But the challenge really is in fixed mandate rates, because that is where it really tests um, your, your expertise in this business. And uh, management is about, as I said, management is about managing the strategies that have been agreed in the executed contract uh, to deliver on our commitment to the client. And also, also translating that catering contract into a plan of action so that you can deliver on your commitment to the client. And as such, in order to deliver on your commitment to the client, you must have a management structure, a staff with people who are experienced in the business, in the catering business. We have had, uh, and I'll just give you as a, a case in point, we, we, we employed a number of uh, site managers and catering managers uh, ex-Afghanistan, from Afghanistan or not, Suppose they work over there for some of the big players like uh, Sadesco or Supreme. We got them in. Uh, we 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 employ them, 
But however, we found that the management aspect was not there. I'll tell you why. In Afghanistan, the United States government was bankrolling the place. So they really did not care about managing portions of what to cook. You know, they cook five gram steaks every day. The United States government was paying for it. When we brought them to Papua New Guinea, they could not manage the portions. They could manage the, 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 um, the kitchen properly. So we had to let them go. So that brings up the fact that it, depending on the type of contract that you have, you need to pick the eye out of that contract into the finer details, break it down into the finer details so that you are able to manage those finer details because every decision, as you and I know, results ultimately in a financial reaction. And that is important. That was a presentation by the Alliance Group National Content and Community Affairs Manager Michael Verapik. We shall have the second part of his talk after the break. Supplying food and PNG is a challenge. Our rugged terrain makes logistics a task in itself. Companies have to make tough decisions on whether to import or use local suppliers. Here's the Alliance Group's National Content and Community Affairs Manager, Michael Verapik, who states some of the challenges they face. Operational challenges, operations management, I suppose, is the key to delivering on our commitment to the client. And our client ranges from ExxonMobil, um, EHL, SO Highlands, up in the plant side uh, in Port Mosby, our, our client there is uh, CJJV, Chioda, uh, Japan Gas Corporation Joint Venture. Up in the Highlands, there's a myriad of clients up there. So, and, and, and the clients have set very, very high standards. They have raised the bar to very, very high standards and expect us to fall in line. And that also is a challenge for us. So part of the challenge uh, for us is sourcing um, our local manpower. And in the joint venture, as I showed you earlier, the joint venture between us and Laba Holdings uh, in Port Mosby and uh, a joint venture with um, up in the Highlands, uh, we source our local employees from the villages around um, the camps around the plant site. It's part of our, our social obligation uh, to our communities and it's also in compliance with the national content plan in, in workforce development that was developed by ExxonMobil. So we source a lot of our employees from the local villages. The challenge is that many of our employees, this is their first and only job. Their first time to wear boots to wear overalls, coveralls, and it is a major challenge for them. Some of them have never worn coveralls before, but this is the first time. So the, the after effects of that is that we have a very, very high rate of absenteeism uh, from our local employees, which is ranging from 25% to 35% on a daily basis. Uh, it's worse on paydays. Uh, they, you know, maybe they have a few beers and you know, it takes two days to slip the hangover off. So it is, it is a major challenge for us. Um, but we can only, we can only, um, we are working with uh, the two partners to try and change the mindset, to change, to, to change the mindset of our people. Uh, because when they don't come to work, they don't get paid, and that is deducted of their pay. And for the villages, the money that is going into the villages are the thousands, the thousands and thousands of kina that is not going into the villages because of absenteeism. So that is a problem that we are trying to deal with. 
Mobilization team of client ramps up uh, schedules is also a major challenge for us. The client gives us uh, the ramp up schedules, and we in uh, when we are able to, or we were supposed to plan according to the schedule, but sometimes the ramp up schedule does not uh, sync with our planning. Uh, so we find ourselves in a situation where we have committed, we have committed resources to manpower and to sourcing of uh, supplies, foodstuffs from overseas and locally, but the client uh, ramp up schedule falls behind. So we have committed resources well in advance. So in managing um, this aspect, there's a lot of uh, interaction between us and the client. We need to be talking all the time. We need to be checking with our clients whether the people are coming. So we've, we've, we've been caught out on this um, occasionally. Uh, mobilization, the mobilization is uh, also an issue. Safety is an aspect that we take personally on, um, in, in respect of our business. Um, NCS only here have clocked up 12.5 million hours, no LTI. Laba Alliance Group uh, at EPC3 in Port Mosby, we've, we've clocked in, in the last 18 months of operation, we've clocked up uh, 2 million hours, uh, no LTI. And up in Hides, we've clocked up uh, 455,000 um, hours, no LTI. And this is, this is pretty impressive from people who have never had a job before. I've just told them that, told you that they, and many of them have blisters, and probably part of the reason why they, they are upset is because of blisters. They've never worn boots before, but it's always a start. Logistical challenges. As I said earlier on, we have about 57 nationalities working for the LNG project, and we've got to source food all over the world to feed them. Now, and um, let me just refer to my notes. Procurement uh, of food uh, is a particularly um, challenging aspect for us because Papua New Guinea cannot meet uh, the demands. Um, we have to, in terms of uh, sourcing of food supplies, 80%, probably 80 to 90% of our meats have to come from overseas. Um, eggs, at the moment we use, we, 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 um, we use about 28,000 eggs a day. 28,000 eggs a day, about 840,000 eggs um, a month. 10 million eggs a year. Now, but 80% of that have to be sourced overseas. Um, we can't, the country cannot meet the demand, and as I, I think I said yesterday, it's a, it is a crying shame. Uh, basically, I mean, we've got the land mess, but we cannot um, provide simple stuff like eggs for our people. I mean. How much investment does it take to, to start a poultry, I suppose? I'm, I'm not, uh, I can't tell you that, but I'm telling you some basic facts that 80% of our, of our meats, 80% of our eggs have to come from overseas. Veggies, 65 to 70% have to be imported into Port Mosby. I mean, those of you who are familiar with uh, Papua New Guinea up, up in Hagen or anywhere in the highlands, they grow the most beautiful cabbage you can find anywhere in the world. Broccoli, tomatoes, and it's very cheap, in the, it's very cheap up there in, uh, you, you go to the Hagen market, and a head of broccoli is one kina. But when you factor in air freight, you factor in road costs, you factor in the terrain, it becomes 10 kina for one head of broccoli if you, you go to the supermarket and buy it. Yesterday, uh, one of our Commentators uh, commented about the infrastructure. The infrastructure in the country is probably the biggest impediment to successful businesses. And it's probably cheaper 
to import broccoli to Port Mosby than to fly down from Antagon. That's the scenario. That's the reality. So we've got a very, very big job to do. We've got a, the government must be serious in addressing the infrastructure. The government must be serious in backing mechanized farming for our people, provide incentives. The banking system must be serious in lending credit to our people to access credit so that they can start up these income earning opportunities. Up, apart from this first LNG project, as we understand, there are two other LNG projects at the back of this. You have Inter Oil and you have uh, Talisman. And some of the world's biggest mines are resident in the country. They are resident in Papua New Guinea. And they need equal amounts of food to feed their troops. So this is an opportunity for Papua New Guinea to go into full-scale mechanized modern agriculture to feed our people. That was the Alliance Group National Content and Community Affairs Manager Michael Varpek. Do join us after the break for the last part of his presentation where we talk about their community affairs program. Like any other business, the Alliance Group is focused on making sure that they develop their personnel and sustain their business. The Alliance Group's Mr. Verapik explains the company's approach. Um, I put customs clearance. That's government. Because sometimes and many times, and those of us who are in the, who import foods and machineries and other stuff, if you like, to the country, sometimes the staff can stay, uh, or the, the containers can stay at the wharf for days on end, or for the whole weekend, because customs have run out of printing paper. They can throw the spanner in the works, and whilst it's staying at the, at the wharf, your food stuff is rotting, especially the perishables. So, you know, these are the kind of challenges that you face. And move, movement of containers from, say, Port Mosby Wharf to the plant site, I mean, it's only 30 kilometers, but if something happens, it can take five days to move the container from the wharf to the plant site. And then in lay to, to, uh, to our people up in Heights, we, we, we use, so we utilize the, the lay port, and from lay up the Highlands Highway into Heights, that's a headache on its own. I mean, the infrastructure is crumbling. Sometimes it takes seven days for a container to get up to height. And it gets even longer if there are landowner issues on the road and the road is blocked or there is a landslide. I mean, these, these are the realities of the challenges that we face up there. Oops, done that. We'll go in a bit to the financials, but I'm not going to lecture to you on financial management and, uh, and, and, and management reporting. Um, but I'd like to also echo another familiar saying, which says that you can make a million bucks and still go broke. And for us, and every time we're talking to our landowners, or we're talking to um, some of the, the, the companies that work with us, uh, we, always, we always tell them there are two things. To be successful and to be sustainable, you must manage two things of your company to expect. And those two things that you need to manage effectively are cash, because cash is king. Cash, you can smoke, you can touch, you can burn, you can spend, you can misappropriate. Cash. And physical assets. Physical assets, you can touch it, you can burn it, you can, again, misuse it. The rest is a figment on your eye. You employ accountants to do that for you. But the two things that you must manage are cash and physical assets. That you must do. The billing process. Um, the clients have very, very high standard of billings in submitting our billings to them. And we try to make sure that Every time 
we send the bill to our clients is right first up. Because if there is an IOTA meeting, the client will throw it back at you. And it may take uh, another 30 days before it is submitted. So sometimes that trading terms of 30 days can escalate into 60 days, it can escalate into 90 days. And at the same time, in the meantime, we are expected to pay for our food costs, we are expected to pay wages, we are expected to, fa to pay our other financial commitments. So we try to instill into our people that, especially our finance people, that the billing process must be right first time. Because if you don't, the client will throw it back at us and it'll take another two weeks before it goes back to them. And if something happens again, then it comes back to us. And then it's, by the time they pay, it's 90 days. So the billing is important. Okay, yes. National content, that's something that's very close to my heart. National content and community affairs. And that's, uh, that's basically, it's my role. Uh, we try to work with them. Uh, basically, in the supply of, uh, of uh, foodstuffs. Um, but having said that, we, we, we impress upon our supply partners that if they want to work with us, they've got to be, they've got to have the capacity and the consistency to supply. The pricing structure must be competitive. And of course, there, there has to be, um, in terms of foodstuff, quality control, which is just so critical. Up in high, in terms of business spin-offs, up in Hyde, we have um, set up uh, six contracts with uh, local landowners up in Hyde. And uh, those contracts involve them supplying us with uh, fresh vegetables and uh, fruits locally grown up in Heights. The beautiful veggies up there. ExxonMobil has also um, a, li a livelihood um, program up there, which is targeted at the resettled people. Uh, and the idea is to get them into food production uh, so that they, uh, they, they are able to sustain themselves uh, as before. Uh, they've given them uh, high-yielding uh, seedlings, and production now is, uh, is exceeding uh, what they can consume. So we are able to tap into the markets as well from our locals up there in order to feed our troops up there. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, we have uh, capacity building programs, which involves um, the apprenticeship program, management trainee program, um, mentoring programs. We are sponsoring a couple of schools uh, from which we sought our apprentices. Uh, and these are all part of uh, capacity building for our internal uh, employees. So that, um, you know, they're able to, to uh, take on uh, higher management roles uh, in the future. And finally, the future for us, you know, with the backing of our parent NCS and of course with the financial muscle and support of the Anitua group of companies, I think that um, the Alliance group is, is well positioned to, to take on any catering project in Papua New Guinea, uh, in, in, in any other mines in Papua New Guinea. And certainly we will be looking at the other two LNG projects when they come on stream. Uh, the opportunities offshore, Combined with NCS, who are also uh, into catering and uh, with our, our parent, the group Anitua, I think uh, the opportunities are also good for us uh, offshore. With those, thank you very much for listening. Do join us after the break for an interview with Mr. Verapik to find out more about the Alliance Group. A business is not a business without its people. It has been said that if you want to make the bottom line, one must look after the front line. Certainly the personnel in a company is very important. 
Here's an interview that I did with the Alliance Group's Michael Verapik. Welcome back, viewers. Now we are joined by the National Content and Community Affairs Manager of PNG, the Alliance, uh, of the Alliance Group, Mr. Michael Verapik. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, tell us a little bit about the Alliance Group. What is it made of? Okay. Who's in it? The Alliance Group is um, a Papua New Guinea company, 100% um, uh, owned by NCS. NCS is in turn owned by the Anitua Group of Companies. Right. The Anitua Group of Companies is owned by the landowners of Lahir, on whose land the giant Lahir gold mine is situated and uh, operated by um, Newcrest Mining Limited. So uh, the Alliance Group uh, is a contractor to the PNG LNG project uh, and our role there is to provide um, camp management, catering, and support services to the LNG project in Papua New Guinea. Tell me, in your company, um, who's in it? Like, in, do we have a lot of women in it, or is it just men? No, we, we have, we have uh, a large number of women. For example, at the plant site, uh, the LNG plant site uh, outside of Port Mosby, uh, near Papa Lela villages there. Um, all our workers are from the four villages of Papa Lela. Boira and Papa. Um, we source them through Laba Holdings and they come from the four villages. And 65% of our employees from those four villages are women. All right. So there's a lot of women working in there. Yes. Um, so in terms of gender equality, it seems you just make sure it's applied right across the board. Then. It, is, it is applied across the board, yeah. All right. So because they seem to be employees um, from these villages, how do you actually build them up in terms of capacity? We put them through um, a lot of training, in-house training. We, every day we, uh, we carry out uh, toolbox meetings, uh, at which time we train our people on how to do things, how to handle equipment, how to prepare chemicals for cleaning uh, offices and um, bathrooms and that kind of thing. And also we have specific uh, training programs for our women, especially in the kitchen in the laundry, how to mix chemicals, that kind of thing. So they undergo a very stringent training program to ensure that they are proficient in what they do because they handle chemicals and they handle a lot of other stuff that are harmful. They've got to be taught how to handle them in a craft. Right. Earlier we were talking about capacity or community mm -hmm. development. Now you have something called capacity building that you try to attend to within the communities you work in. Yeah. Are you able to talk about some of the projects that you have? Yes, uh, we, have, uh, we have capacity building programs and these programs are aimed at building internal capacities within our company and they include um, the apprenticeship program. We have an apprenticeship program uh, that we've commenced and what we'll do is we'll select uh, people, our, our own employees with uh, potential, and then we put them through the apprenticeship program. We've had discussions with uh, the Department of Labor, and they're very supportive, and we'll roll this program out by um, September this year. So how many apprentices do you have right now? At this stage, because we, our, our, our focus of operations is down here at the plant site in Port Mosby, and also up in Hides, up in the southern Hyde, in uh, Hela province. Um, at this stage, we're looking at putting in um, 10 people, three, uh, five from Heights and five from down here. And then as we roll the program along on a, year, on a yearly basis, we will eventually increase the number coming in. Other aspects of our programs include um, management trainee program. Again, we, we select um, people with management potential and we put them through a rigorous on-the-job training uh, program in, um, in all phases of our business. Uh, and we will complement that with um, tertiary programs that we are currently identifying uh, in um, um, disciplines such as uh, frontline management or a diploma in management to upskill them and to bring their potential um, management capabilities up so that um, they can be able to take over. Um, some of the roles and functions of our business. Thank you for staying with us. After the break, we shall talk about the food.
In this part of our interview, Mr. Verpik gives the specifics of what goes into trying to satisfy the many different palettes of the workers at the sites they cater for. So it seems training is a major um, part of your business and it seems that standards have to be met all the time because I believe your company, um, according to, it's, it's, uh, it had some dealings with Kuwait before, it's a pretty big company. Yes, uh, initially the Alliance Group was a joint venture between NCS and um, Gulf Catering of Kuwait. Um, early in April this year, NCS bought out uh, its international partner, GCC Services, and now uh, the Alliance Group is now a Papua New Guinea company, 100% owned by NCS. Um, certainly, uh, our business, in, in our business, we handle um, food. And, and food can go off very easily. So for us to be able to serve the kind, of, the kind of quality food that the client deserves, we've got to train our people in the best way of handling foods, the best way of preserving foods, setting temperatures, and also in the art of cooking. So that the end product that we give to our client uh, is the product that the client deserves, and at the end of the day, we have a satisfied client. So how many people are actually in this, that you serve on a daily basis? Is there an estimate? Okay, yes, down at the plant site at the moment, we have about 7,500 site residents, which have to be fed three square meals a day. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of food, and that includes um, day workers of about probably a thousand which have to be also fed uh, crib meals. And that um, is not counting about two and a half, three thousand 3,000 residents up in Heights, which we have to also feed three square meals a day, plus day workers. So all up, right now we have about probably 9,000 site residents at uh, the plant site down here and Heights. So that's, uh, we've got to feed them three square meals a day. So we've talked a lot about food before the commercial break. Let's talk more about the menu. Um, what exactly do you offer the people that you serve up at this mining petroleum sites? Certainly sourcing food for the international workforce at uh, the PNG LNG project, which includes um, the plant site at portion 152 and up in Hides. Uh, at last count, we have about 57 nationalities. That's a lot of people. So we, yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, workers in the LNG project from all over the world. And certainly one of our challenges is to source um, food from all over the world to, to satisfy the international taste buds of our international workforce. It is a major challenge in terms of sourcing the right food, the logistics of bringing it in, making sure it's fresh, as the saying is, from the paddock to the plate so that at the end of the day, the customer is satisfied when he's sitting down on the table eating his food. So it is a major challenge. And also certainly in, uh, in preparing the menu, um, because of the international array of people that we have to serve, um, we, have, we have to give a lot of thought into menu preparation, what is included in the menu, and how you structure the menu so that you don't upset people, especially uh, when some of our workforce are um, Muslims. Yes. We do have Muslims who work for the international law, uh, for the LNG project, and we have to structure the menu in such a way that it conforms with their beliefs and their religion. So that is a major challenge. Well, that's, uh, so is it true, let's say the food that they serve, could you say that sometimes that you people get attracted to working in those sites because of the food that you produce or you make? The food, the food is certainly um, world class and, and I mean we, uh, we comply with the standards that are set by the developer who is ExxonMobil, DHL, and down at the plant site uh, is CJJV. They set very high standards of um, food so we have to, as, as a contractor in, in uh, providing that service, we must comply with the high standards of hygiene, high standards of food preparation, high standards of food quality. 
so that at the end of the day we have a satisfied workforce. To stay with us, more of that interview after this break. With the catering service, there is the constant demand for food. It seems that in PNG, this is an avenue that still needs to be tapped into. We source most of our food overseas despite having the land to do so here. So, still on food, where do you get some of the food from Papua New Guinea? Because the vegetables and all that. Okay, sadly enough, and I, I, I say this with passion because uh, my role is to work with uh, landowner businesses in terms of um, providing veggies, vegetables to our kitchens. 65% of the vegetables that we need for our kitchens still come from overseas. Okay. Papua New Guinea has a land mass that can produce these vegetables, but sadly enough, we are not producing vegetables in the capacity that we need. The capacity and also the quality? Capacity and the quality that okay. we need. So we are forced to import 65% of our vegetables from overseas, flown in, trucked in, sea freighted in, in containers right. for the project. Okay. And that also goes for um, meats, be it pork, chicken, beef. 80% of these will have to be imported from overseas, including eggs. At the moment, we are we're using, we're utilizing about 28,000 eggs a day. That's a lot of eggs. That's a lot of eggs. 28,000 eggs a day and all. Certainly, uh, the local producers uh, supply a bit, but mostly we have to import it because we do not have the capacity here. And that is something for us Papua New Guineans and for the government to address so that this is a business opportunity that um, can benefit, the people can benefit from setting up these things because apart from this uh, current LNG project, there are two other LNG projects out there. There's Talisman and there's the Inter Oil Project yes. and also some of the world's biggest mines are resident here. That's true. And the market is here for vegetables, for poultry, for piggery, for beef. And what are we doing about it? That is my question. Looks like it's something to think about. Yeah. Now, you said that you worked with landowner companies before. Um, with the company you're with now, the Alliance Group, how much of a of uh, how much work do you actually do with landowner companies here in Papua New Guinea? Okay. Um, before I took this job uh, with the Alliance Group, I worked only here uh, as general manager of a landowner uh, business association called Lamala. Uh, and my role there was to work with the land owners um, in terms of developing their businesses, in terms of representing them with the developer of the Lihir gold mine, in terms of negotiating their benefits. So I was like their spokesman, in other words, um, in representing the people. And prior to that, I worked in, in um, a land owner company up in Kiunga a uh, lower octetti investment company. And I play the same roles uh, in terms of representing the people in negotiations with OTML, octetti mining, and also developing um, their business interests and developing um, uh, the people to be able to take over those uh, responsibilities. Right. So with the Anitua and NCS group, mm -hmm. um, how does that tie in with everything that you do now? Okay, um, as I previously mentioned, um, the Alliance Group is 100% uh, fully owned by NCS. NCS uh, is uh, again 100% fully owned by Anitua. Now just a little bit about our parent, which is NCS. NCS um, are a major player in the food industry. Uh, they provide uh, camp management, catering and support services to all the Defence Force camps in Papua New Guinea. They also provide the same service to the Lihir Gold Project on Lihir. And also they have um, 
um, op they operate partnerships with local landowners in, I believe, Basamuk and up in uh, Hidden Valley. Right. And they've just, I think, uh, cleansed the Wafi Golpu catering project in uh, Morobe province. And that's a huge one because once that goes into full production, we understand there will be a permanent site residence of about 9,000 people for over a long period of time. Which would be a lot of business. There will be a lot of business and those people will have to be fed three square meals a day. So sourcing of food to feed this kind of workforce in Papua New Guinea is a major challenge. But for us it should be seen as an opportunity. An opportunity for us Papua New Guineans an opportunity for us to go into these income generating activities to be able to feed the workforce here because the market is here. So what are the future prospects for uh, the Alliance Group? The future prospects for uh, the Alliance Group is, uh, is very bright actually. I mean uh, with the backing of NCS and also the backing of uh, the Anitua Group and the financial muscles, the prospects for us internationally and domestically is very good. Um, there are opportunities here in Papua New Guinea in respect of other developments and also internationally that we can go into. So for us, the future is very bright. That's it for another edition of Resource PNG. You can watch this presentation again online on our Resource PNG page at www.mtv.com.pg. Please send us any suggestions you may have to resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. Until next time, I wish you a pleasant week.